Hey. How's it going? That's good. Uh, my name is Justin. If uh, you don't know, um, I just spilled coffee all up my nose. Sorry, drinking out of my cup. So I made it even more awkward for all of us. Um, Exodus, the journey continues, right? Chapter 5, chapter 6, go ahead and turn to chapter 5. Moses was just given a ton of incredible things that he was supposed to share with the Israelite elders to help them understand that Yahweh had truly spoken to him in this individual alone conversation on a mountain called Wasteland in the middle of the desert. So he goes to Egypt, and at the end of chapter 4, verses 29 to 31, he says these things, or it says these things about him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. So they went, gathered the elders together, and it says this, all the words the Lord had spoken to Moses, Aaron spoke. And all the signs that were shown inside of the people, Aaron and Moses showed those signs to the people. And it says this, the people believed. Now, we can't skip past this. Um, Derek taught this last week, but we can't skip past it to start this week because at the end of the day, you're talking about 400 years of being in Egypt and being enslaved by the God King Pharaoh. And you'll hear me say that today a number of times, the God King. It's about how he saw himself, and he had no reason to assume otherwise. This people who were slaves now heard from God, saw wonders and signs from Yahweh. And it says what? They believed. What? They believed that God was back on the scene again, like he was around again. He was going to be doing things amongst his people. It says, when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshipped. So now worship is commencing amongst those who have seen the signs and the wonders and the story of the arrival of Yahweh. It's pretty rad. I mean, it's kind of what I wish would happen every time I came to church on a Sunday, right? Like, God showed up, we saw signs and wonders. He visited with us. Let's bow our heads and worship. Spirits were high amongst the Israelite elders at this point in time, no doubt about it, at the end of chapter 4. And the reality is that when a fresh call of God comes in any of our lives, it's met by initial excitement, anticipation, forward-looking. But the other reality of a call of God is that it's to carry light into somewhere into this world that's covered in darkness. God doesn't give you a call for your benefit. He gives you a call for the benefit of his kingdom and his glory. And he may employ you in it. But the point is to bring light to darkness, always. And so we can't forget that. It's not that man would receive glory. It's that God would receive ultimate glory. And the way he does that is by using men and women like you and me to do God types of things as he does them through us. In other words, the call of God is always too big for us. You've heard me say that several times already. But into dark places, that's where light is needed. So the call of God in the end of chapter 4, amongst the Israelite elders and Moses and Aaron, seems unquestionably achievable, right? Yeah. I mean, this guy can turn his hand into a leprous hand just by putting it in his coat and pulling it back out. This guy can throw his staff on the ground, and it turns into a serpent, and then he can pick it back up. We got this. There was unity. All eyes looked ahead. The word and the wonders of God were received. The tension was set for Yahweh, 
not just to move on a mountain, but to like move mountains, move pyramids, if you will. I'm not saying they were built then. I'm not saying I know which Pharaoh scripture is talking about. Sorry. In fact, it's peculiar. Pharaoh never gets a name in Exodus because he's unimportant in the story other than just oppressing the Egyptians or the Israelites. Everyone gets a name except for him. He just gets called the king. The eyes looked ahead. The tension was set for Yahweh to move mountains. And from a distance, a new day was upon them, and God had things to do. But as all of us may know, I'll assume that we do, that when God calls anyone or maybe you to something, that the work isn't just to be done outside of you, it's to be done inside of you, right? That you going through the process of being changed is part of what God wants in what he wants to change in the world. So he's not like, you know, hey, Mike, we're going to send you to your job so you can change the entire world at your job. He's like, no, I'm going to change you in the process as well. So the wrecking ball hits everybody at the same time. You may be the representative of God, but you're going to have to change to usher in what's going to happen. And this is what we begin to see as Moses obeys what God is asking him to do. God is going to whittle him down into absolute dependence, which means there is no more comforts, no more simple pleasures, no more relaxation, only activation and potential destruction is knocking at his door. Let's pick up in Exodus 5, verses 1 to 3. It says the word afterwards. So afterward, that's after the elders and Moses had met. You know, expectations were high. People were excited. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. And they say this. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast with me or to me in the wilderness. Okay. I mean, it's not like a massive ask, but it is an ask. And we're going to find out why it causes so much trouble. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. And they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, period. Please let us go a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So Moses and Aaron leave the company of the Israelite elders, and they go to Pharaoh, and they say this as their opening line to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the word their Lord is Yahweh. This is a foreign word to the God King, Pharaoh. And so he responds, who is the Lord that I should obey him or his voice? And who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Since Pharaoh sees himself as a god, it's no surprise the disdain he feels towards the request that's coming to him. Pharaoh would have been told his whole life that he would become Pharaoh. That he would be the god king. That all other gods would find their substance in him that he would sustain the land. And now there's this God that is the God over the greater population in Egypt, by the way, that is showing up and talking to the Israelites. It's all threat, right? It's all threat. The God King for the first time is going to start wrestling with God level instability. Who is Yahweh that I should heed him or listen to him by releasing Israel? I don't know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not release Israel. Mind you, a narrator is writing this for us after the fact. And what's important to 
to the writer is that we are asking the questions that need to be asked along the way. And so the story is being told in a way that brings us along in the journey. Does that make sense? And the, the reader here, in my opinion, is invited to explore this very question for themselves. Who is Yahweh? Who is Yahweh? If all you had was the book of Exodus, then what you know is that he's someone that's heard and seen the afflictions and will remember his covenant. He's Yahweh that speaks as fire in a bush that is not consumed. He's Yahweh that brings his presence into our fallen natural realm and exposes us to the glory of who he is. He's Yahweh who is going to go back to Egypt with Moses and together they will redeem and restore and rescue the entire population of the Israelites. That is who Yahweh is. If all we had to look at God was Exodus 1, 1 through 5, right where we're at, that's all you would know. Those are huge things to know about God, right? He is existence. He is eternity. He is without beginning. This is Yahweh. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing that we see would be. Because he is existence. Who is Yahweh? I don't know this Yahweh. Moreover, I won't release Yahweh's people. The Pharaoh is posturing already. And so they answer him because they still have faith in God. Spirits are high. And they said, God has met with us. Verse three. And go back one, Dory, if you would. Uh, are we, where are we? Yep. Go back one more. Okay, so I'm dumb. I'm on my way, guys. Let me catch up with you. <laughs> then, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Found it. Please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice. So the word here is interesting. It said the God of the Hebrews is really delineating it just to the people of the Hebrews has met with us. But what's fascinating in this is that there's something added to the story, and you see it in the very last line of this slide. Let us go and have this feast, but if you don't, pestilence will fall on us, or the sword will fall on us, or will strike us down. These two pieces of terminology carry overtones of judgment until death. Every time you see them in scripture, the word pestilence literally means bubonic plague in scripture. The overtone is judgment and judgment unto death. In other words, they are threats and they're not threats. It says, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. The us there is inclusive of Pharaoh, his people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians, all in one. There's an added threat. The story has changed. If you remember the conversation that God had with Moses, where in that conversation did he say that if you don't obey me, I'm going to strike you with bubonic plague or I'm going to cut you down with the sword? Nowhere. The story was never about coming after the Israelites. It was always about delivering the people of Israel from the oppression of the Egyptians, right? Neither of these threats were included in the original counter between God and Moses. Moses was supposed to go to Pharaoh with the elders, according to God's call as well. There is no elders there. Moses is adding to the story in the presence of Pharaoh. Moses alters the story most commentators would say, to make God appear more awesome or fierce. And this highlights a couple things for us. This highlights that when humans participate in the work of God, they still wind up doing human things sometimes. So never look at somebody that's up here teaching you, you know, two or four or eight times, you know, over the next season of your life, thinking that we are perfect or we are able to do things that no one else is able to do. We are all humans dependent on God. 
And we are all susceptible to our own pride and to our own weakness. Moses' weakness is exposed here a bit. Participating in the perfect work of God as an imperfect human yields strange responses at times. But this also evidences the fear that was inside of Moses and Aaron as they brought the message to Yahweh, the God King, the Pharaoh. And I would say this, that in the face of darkness and oppression, like they were walking in, carrying the light of the truth of the call of God into the court of the Pharaoh, the God King, and they're talking with the light of God to the most powerful superpower that there was in that time of human history, they feel weak. They may feel powerless. In the presence of opposition, the word and the call of God can feel completely powerless. Would you agree? Remember, the word of God is truth, and it can hold its own. It can also hold you. And remember this, too. The word of God has work to do. Just let it speak for itself as best you can. Proverbs 4.21 says this about the word of God, that when they're found and held close, they're life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Imagine if Moses had gone in, like put his arm around Pharaoh and said, hey, if you do this, it's going to be life for you and healing. Too soon in the story, right? <laughs> Proverbs happens later. Pharaoh responds, Exodus 5, 4 to 5. But the king said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? He changes the subject. Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day... Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen. You shall no longer give the people straw to make their bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks they made in the past, you shall impose on them still. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Those are heavy words, right? Exodus 5, 4 to 5, the beginning there. The king said to them, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. Pharaoh has no sympathy for the request. In fact, he imposes more punishment, and he accuses Moses and Aaron for encouraging the people to neglect their work. Verse 5, the people in the land says that there are so many now, and you make them rest. It's very interesting in verse 5. The people of the land are many and you make them rest from their burdens. The word rest there that is used by the writer of Exodus uses the same root word for Sabbath. You make them Sabbath from their laboring. In other words, Pharaoh is so scared that if you let that many people rest, they might start to get their own ideas about what they could do with their time. Spoken like a true oppressor. I'm sorry if you have one as a boss. I'm sorry if you have one as a friend. They are, we are, all in those shoes sometimes. But here, it's the same route for Sabbath, setting attention for a new thing that's going to come at a holy mountain at some point in time, right? A new day that's set aside for such a thing. Pharaoh makes them unceasingly shoulder their burden. God at Sinai will have the people lay down their burden on a seventh day so they can rest. And that's what the good God, Yahweh, does. 
not the God, King, Pharaoh. Exodus 5, 6 through 9, it's still up there. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters and their foremen with an edict that the people should still make their bricks, but now they have to collect their own straw. I find it fascinating already in the text. The people are always just called the people. You don't get to know their names, their jobs, their role, their faces, their homes, their stories. They're the silent ones in the story up until now. They're the ones being spoken of. They're this possession that's being wrestled over and being deliberated about. Maybe reminiscent of how we feel towards those that are houseless in our community. Always talking about, but rarely ministering to them. Always talking about what they may feel or think, but never asking them. This is all about them, but they never get a seat at the table. What's fascinating is looking back through history, and I did a very deep dive here, you can actually find ancient ledgers that show how many bricks were required to be made by those that were slave laborers in Egypt during the reign of one of the pharaohs. I won't go too deep. And it was fascinating. There was ledgers noting that there needed to be 2,000 bricks made per brick-making period. And they were set up like a, an Excel spreadsheet with deposits being made. And there was one particular slave laborer. I forget his name at the moment. I forgot to write it down. His entire ledger was found written in ancient manuscripts. A deposit of 323 bricks another deposit of 460 bricks. And at the end, it said that he was in the negative, 200 and something bricks. This was common practice and has been exposed as true through ancient documentation that there was quotas being put on slave laborers to make sure that they were working hard enough and they qualified and quantified so they were getting idiosyncratic and, and micro-control over every single one of those that were laboring as slaves. Not only that, there was Egyptian taskmasters who made the Israelites into slaves, and then Israelite foremen that worked for the Egyptian taskmasters, and both of them were commanded by the Pharaoh to not bring straw to the slaves so they could not make their bricks with the straw. On top of that, they were told to go find their own. We'll look at that in a second. Do you see the system of oppressiveness? Do you see how many degrees separation there is from the bottom class to the top class? Do you see how the top class treated the bottom class? And when you think about this picture of taskmasters of Egypt overseeing Israelite foremen, I mean, man, I wouldn't have wanted to be a foreman. Hey, I'm one of you guys, but I kind of work for these guys. I'm going to help them oversee you in all of your slavery. It's cool. We're friends, right? Very fascinating. When you think of the strata of social system, from Pharaoh all the way down to slave, who was Jesus coming for and who did he come to? Where did he make his home? Who did he walk with? Where did he lay his head? Where did his message come to? The slaves. That's where Jesus showed up, right? The, the commoner. Did he get voice other places? Sure. At the end. This is the system. And Pharaoh goes on further and he says this. He says, let heavier work be laid upon the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. He says the words of Moses and Aaron are lying words. Now, was there some things that were non-truth in what they shared? Yeah. God didn't say he was going to strike them with bubonic plague and slash them down with a sword if they don't listen. God does many other things in the text. 
But ultimately, Pharaoh's saying that anything that Yahweh says, because Yahweh isn't God, holds no power and no authority. And if it holds no power and no authority, then every word that comes from this Yahweh is a lie. So Pharaoh starts to express this new form of leadership amongst the people, Exodus 5, 10 to 14. You can go to the next one, Dory. The taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and they said to the people, thus says Pharaoh. Well, how did this start? Thus says the Lord, right? Do you see the drama that's being played out between the God King, the self-proclaimed God King, and Yahweh, the one that is existence, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? There's a drama that is playing out in the text that we can't miss. Pharaoh declares over all of the people, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. I will deal in practicals to control you. I will not give you straw. Go get your own straw for yourselves wherever you can find it. But your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout the land and uh, throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters were urgent, saying, complete your work, your daily task um, each day, as when there was no straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had sent over them, were beaten and were asked, why haven't you done all of the task, making bricks today and yesterday, as you did in the past? Sounds like taunting. The people were scattered to gather their own stubble and straw. Basically, what was left over in the field. If you've ever cut down a plant just to its stubble, they're pulling it out of the ground to include it in their bricks. It takes a lot more mud to make a brick if you don't have straw in it. And the bricks are more susceptible to breaking because there's no straw in them. So the work is even more difficult to, to be done. In verse 14, it says that now even the foremen, those were who were like 50-50, halfway one foot in Egypt, halfway one foot in Israel, were being beaten now. Control. What's interesting is when it says the foremen of Israel were beaten, it's the same terminology, not word for word, but idea for idea of what God uses when he says he will strike Egypt. You see the play? You can exercise authority over my people all you want, but I will strike you the same way that you struck them. This whole thing was about restoration, redemption, deliverance, bringing out the people of Israel. Tensions are building. There's breaking points starting to happen all over the place. Exodus 5, 15 through 18. The foremen of the people cried out. They came to Pharaoh and they said, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given and you say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. They're starting to turn on each other. But he said this, you're idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The taskmasters have now beaten the Israelite foreman. The foreman come before Pharaoh and say, why are you doing this? The Pharaoh cuts them off and says, go do your work with the rest of the slaves. There's breakdown after breakdown taking place amongst the hierarchy in the system of oppression that's in, Israel, or that's in uh, Egypt. Now there's a breaking point that goes on further, Exodus 5, 19 to 21. The foremen of the people of Israel, when they saw that they were in trouble because Pharaoh did not ease up on this, they saw they were in trouble. And when they said, you shall by no means reduce the number of bricks, 5, 19 to 21. So they met with Moses and Aaron. Some of these people may have been the ones that were excited bowing their heads in worship, knowing that God was about to do a new thing, the ones with whom hope was high, 
God was going to bring about something special. Why, when God does something new, do we think it's the erasing of every single thing that might be difficult in our lives and the replacement of, like, it with utopia? That is like a fundamental false human expectation that happens. Like, God's just going to erase all the bad and only give me good. God has glory to be had in you being part of bringing about the good. He has glory to be had in you. He has glory to be had through you. Why is this playing out? Because God has glory to be had. Why is this playing out? That Yahweh would be known. So they come to Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look upon you. They're saying this to Moses and Aaron. The Lord look upon you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Hmm. So the foremen now, the Israelites, are turning on Moses. Moses must have felt like he finally found his clan. You know, we say this a lot in our culture, like, I found my tribe. Like, he literally found his tribe. <laughs> like, it, they're called tribes of Israel as a joke. But, like, not really because it's real. And now he's cut off because he's following the God of that tribe, of those people. The Israelite foreman turn on him. And then they pronounce judgment on him and they say, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. This is a Old Testament kind of statement of dis just disgust. It happens in Genesis as well. You've made me a stench. You've made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. You have put a sword in their hand to kill us. The breakdown between Moses and the foreman had taken place. So you have a people that are working as slaves, being taken care of by foremen that are overseeing them, that work for taskmasters, that are enslaving them. But something about that must have been comfortable after 400 years of order this way, right? Just like some broken and enslaved pieces of our lives are probably comfortable after being broken for so long in our lives. Correct? I just remember wrestling with depression so aggressively for so long that I knew myself better as a depressed individual than one that wasn't. It was almost more comfortable to go home to being depressed than to go home to being healthy, if you will. And sometimes slavery comes knocking on the door still, right? Is that not life? <coughs> but now the system was exploding. Things were getting worse before they could get better. The truth of God was spoken in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't like it. Pharaoh went after the Israelites. He did it through his taskmasters. He did it to the foremen that came from Israel. And now what's happening is those that worked for Pharaoh are turning against Moses for the very word of God that was given to them to save them all. They're blaming Moses. There's a breakdown. A redefinition is underway, and it came through the death of old systems, old processes, but it came through the mention of the word of God. Listen, bringing truth to something sometimes has to expose it before it can heal it, right? The Word of God illuminates the things in my life that suck or are broken or messed up or that I'm enslaved to. It gets worse and then God gives me grace and it gets better. But it's on His timetable, not mine. Because if, if I had a timetable, I would just get rid of it and like fix, 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 fix. The breaking point turns from that. The distrust now of the foreman of Israel, they turn towards Moses, Exodus 5, 22 and 23. 
They turn towards Moses. They're expressing this distrust, this disdain towards Moses. Moses then turns to the Lord and questions again. Oh, Lord, why have you done this? Why have you done evil to this people? Question mark. Why did you ever send me? Question mark. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Hmm. Moses is breaking. The foremen were breaking. Israel was breaking. The God King was being questioned. His treatment of the Israelites was breaking. All of it was starting to come apart, and nobody could see it because they were distracted by how ugly it got when it was exposed. Moses speaks to the Lord. Why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name... He has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. In the face of his rejection, Moses turns to God out of shattered confidence. Shattered confidence in God's ability, in God's word, in God's call, in God's purpose, in God's power. I mean, if you think about it, how many of us have lost confidence in even gathering together on Sunday mornings in buildings in what we call church? Lost confidence in God's ability to do something special amongst a group of people, something sacred, losing confidence in God's word. Because Google's quicker, faster. Because people aren't living the word out. Because systems aren't set up right. In God's call, in God's purpose, in God's power, shattered confidence. The only solution is an experience with Yahweh. Is it not? In this broken state, Moses, and I might say, if that's you, if you've lost and have shattered confidence in God's ability, word, call, purpose, or power in your life or in the gathered body or in your world or in your family or whatever it is, that broken down state makes you susceptible to hear God's voice if you turn to him. Moses does not stay silent and run from God. He turns to God with the questions that we should be asking God when we feel them. Nothing in our world is a surprise to him. He returns to God, the cornerstone. God is always refining our connection to him. It's essential that our lives carry a singular motivation and agenda, and that would be to know Yahweh in all things. He's constantly whittling us down into that full dependence on him. And Moses cries out with all of those things. Seems like it's failed, right? At this point, like if this was the end of the book now, kind of like over. The people just got wrecked and Moses is now cast out almost. There's a darkness to this. And I want to remind you that evil will never go away without a fight. The prince of the power of the air hates when we take the kingdom that he thinks he has and replace it with a kingdom of light and the kingdom of Yahweh. It will never go away without a fight. What the enemy has possession of often will not bow down as quickly as we would like it to. Evil has roots that are deeply interwoven into this world. To the fourth generation, says scripture, and I'm sure beyond, through inherited DNA, the patterns of sin, darkness, and death 
are revisited upon family tree after family tree after family branch. Thank God for Jesus. But even that, Jesus says some demons, some darkness like that, could only be cast out through prayer and fasting. There's a battle. It's a battle, is it not? It's breaking apart an entire social strata in Egypt because the word of God has been spoken and Yahweh is brought to the scene. Moses is even doubting that this is the right thing to do, but he brings his things to God. How do you talk to God again? We call it prayer, right? There's a spiritual battle that's going on here, and it's always necessary to get to the roots. God was exposing the darkness with light. It would only get worse before it got better. Think about this. Jesus could have come to earth, touched it with his toe, been crucified for not being sinful and being a perfect sacrifice for us, been resurrected and been zapped straight back up to home to heaven and been a salvation for all of us that quick. If he wanted to make it that way, he could have done it. But what did he do? He came, lived amongst as one of us, became flesh like us. We have a Savior who's able to sympathize with us now and the things that we deal with. He didn't just send Jesus real quick to die, resurrect, and then go home. Jesus had a calling to carry out to disrupt the social, political, spiritual, sinful systems that had been set up in this place that was intended to be a dwelling place with God in a garden existence, right? And he brought the truth of God to expose the darkness and the lies that they would know the way and the truth and the life and the door and the way to get to God and that no one would get to God but through Jesus. Had he just come and touched the ground and been resurrected after a crucifixion for us, we would not have known who? Yahweh. He came and fought the spiritual battle that Yahweh would be revealed through the battle, through the crisis, through the overthrowing of those systems, through the rejection, through being crucified for saying the word of God. He came to reveal the Father, Yahweh, decisively and became a sacrifice for us. And in some way, always, the messenger or messengers of God will become a sacrifice for God's glory. Moses has this conversation with God, and it goes on in Exodus 6, 1 to 5. says, The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. With a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Most commentators believe that strong hand is a reference to God's hand. Verse 2, and God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as God Almighty. Not Yahweh. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. This is a special revelation, this Yahweh, this personal name that can be known I established my covenant with them and, and gave to give them the land of Canaan and the land which they lived in as sojourners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Verse 6, and this is where we're going to park today, because I think there's incredible language here. He tells Moses, go say my word again. You think Moses is excited about this? No. No. As a counselor and as like a mediator and a friend and a pastor, I'm usually stuck in the middle of two parties, um, often, listening to both sides. And I'll be honest, when it's time to deliver information from one side to the other, that journey turning from one party and heading towards the other one is not fun, right? You know, it's if you're doing any kind of spiritual leadership, you're in these kind of contexts and constructs where you have to carry information that's going to be difficult and the weight is unbearable. So he hears from God and now he's going to say this to the people. 
Say this to the people of Israel. Here's those people again. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land I swore to give you, or I swore to give Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. These are words of liberation, right? How many of you long to be liberated? Words of liberation. I just want to look at these three. It says, I will bring you out. I will deliver you and I will redeem. Bring out means to bring from underneath the burden. And I'll share this with you. I've said this about other things and I think it applies to this as well. The I will statements about God need to become he will statements for us in order to become faithful for us. So faith-filled statements. It's not like, well, God says I will. That's great. Yes, he does say that, but what does that mean to you? Is he Yahweh? Because if he's Yahweh to you, then he will bring you out like he brought them out. If he says I will bring out, I will deliver, I will redeem, okay? He will bring out, he will deliver, he will redeem. Those are faith statements for me now about who my Yahweh is, if I can even call him mine. Thank God for Jesus. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. He is the God who brings us out from under the authority, from under the burden. Jesus says that he doesn't leave you burdenless, but he replaces your burden and yoke with one that's light and one that's easy, one that's not ill-fitting, right? Thank God. There's still work to do, but the burden is not unbearable, oppressive, or enslavement. It's freedom and life. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you. The word there across the entire Old Covenant, more often than not, means I will make you separate. Sounds cool, right? Does that sound like something else? In the New Testament, the idea of being set apart. I will deliver you. This is a physical deliverance that's being mentioned here. It's literal deliverance with spiritual overtones. And how often in our world we're like, man, I just need deliverance. And it's usually 90% spiritual with 10% physical. For them, it was quite different. But he's not just the God who he will bring us out or he will bring them out in the story here. But he's the God who delivers, who will deliver us. Who delivers them. We'll find that as the story goes on in the coming weeks. The third word, and probably the most important word for us this morning, is I will redeem, is the word. The God who redeems. Did you know the majority of references in Old Testament scripture to the word redeem pertain to family? I think it's fascinating. Someone's alarm is going off somewhere. You're late. Sorry, it's my favorite alarm response. In the Old Testament, the majority of references to redeem pertain to family. And it's in this context that a member of a family would be assisting relatives in a time of trouble and that would be referenced as you would be redeeming them. God has referenced Israel. He says, Israel is my son earlier on in Exodus. So when we think about God redeeming, 
This is part of Israel becoming God's treasured possession in a family sense. He calls them his treasured possession in Exodus 19.5. In other words, he is the God who redeems. He will redeem. And the greatest sense of this is that they're being redeemed from being in trouble and placed back in the family that they're intended to be a part of. Isn't that cool? I will take you to be my people. I will be your God is what happens after that. So God says. Exodus 6, 9, it says this. Moses spoke to the people, but they did not listen because their broken spirit and harsh slavery. It gives two descriptors that they had a broken spirit and harsh slavery. And I have compassion on them when I read this. And we're going to wrap in this section right here today. Like I said before, the people in the story have been voiceless for the most part. As upper level leadership deliberate about the power or the control or the authority or the systems or the processes or how they're going to organize or who's doing what, when and where. All along the way, we hear the voice of leadership, but we never hear the voice of the people. Boots on the ground, laboring in the fields day to day, collecting straw to meet their brick quotas and still causing their foreman relatives to be beaten. They're the ones exhausted by the process, burdened by the day-to-day -day restless labor, questioning of the relationships, the future. The hope is dwindling for them. They're questioning God. They're questioning their identity. All that they are is laborers. And God is saying to those people in those statements, I will bring you out, Yahweh. Yahweh will deliver. Yahweh will redeem, but it feels far and like a waste of time to them because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. The word broken spirit there says that they have an absence of wind or breath in them, in their soul, or physical exhaustion. And harsh slavery means harsh slavery. How many of these feel familiar to you? Exhausted by the process, burdened by the day-to-day, -day, the restless, tireless laborer, questioning relationships, future hope dwindling, questioning God, questioning identity, nothing other than just a worker sentenced to slavery underneath the oppressive hand of the world we live in. And God saying, I will bring you out. I will deliver. I will redeem. And it feels null and void. Where are you at? Broken? Enslaved? When I say that he's the God who brings out, delivers, redeems. Have you lost hope? Is there a sense of faithlessness? Do you need help? Do you need help? Do you need prayer? Do you need freedom, liberation, deliverance, redemption, identity, life, life abundant? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Yahweh? Because underneath this whole story is people like you and me struggling with the same sorts of things. 
Our slavery may look different. Our oppression may look different. But our exasperation may be the same. Do you need prayer today? Roy sent me a text this week. And he said, are we ever going to close service with times of ministry and prayer? And I was in the middle of studying this passage and realized that God had sent me a messenger. So I'm just going to cold lay this entire text on you in your life and say, what do you need from Jesus? The team's going to come back and and sing. Um, Those of us who want to come forward, if you're elders, for sure, pastors, for sure, have gifts that you want to pray for people with, for sure, We'll spread around the room, and we're going to sing, and we're going to pray for you. Have you lost faith in he's a God that brings you out, will deliver, will redeem, that he wants to make you his possession? Have you lost it? Have you lost faith and belief in those things? Are you enslaved and need liberation? We don't worship liberation. That's like chasing our problems. We worship Yahweh. He takes care of that. We're here to pray you through that. So if you need it, we're going to sing, but we're going to spread ourselves out. And as you feel bold enough, come on down or over or anywhere. I didn't want to overstructure it. And we'll, uh, we'll pray for you, and then I'll close us out here in about a little bit.
still talk and hang, but if uh, coming down in front of an entire room full of people is awkward, uncomfortable, then guess what? You're normal. Um, we'll be sticking around afterwards. Um, some of you are carrying burdens, for sure. Come get help. Come get prayer. Super easy. It's just it's what God's called us into. Don't ignore the thing that you may be hearing. Um, so I'll pray and close us, and you guys can still talk and fill the room. Bailey's just going to play for a little bit still. And, um, but if you need prayer, we'll still be hanging out for the next little bit. So, Father, we just say thank you for guiding us through the text, the scripture, and for the welcome moments of, hey, let's pray for each other that we can do when we're gathered. And we love you. We desire you, Yahweh, make yourself known amongst us.